Hey friends, good morning, good evening, good night, wherever around the world you are, and you're more than welcome. Glenn, how are you doing? Hi, it's been seven days. <laughs> I'm doing good. How about you? It's good to be back here. So uh... It's great to have you back. It's good to be back for myself as well. It has been seven days indeed, and I actually miss those days and miss the days for in-person events as well. But this might do for now. <laughs> yeah, this is as, as close as it gets, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So last week we actually talked about change feed and we have had a fun conversation on Azure Functions. I see that you're wearing an Azure Functions t-shirt today. Yeah, I was a bit jealous on um, your Cosmos DB shirt of last week. So I, I <laughs> dig down my closet and find, uh, find the next best thing. So this is what I came up with. We almost have matching t-shirts today. My, my t-shirt is a Microsoft Ignite t-shirt from a couple of years ago when the, when the events were back in the days when they were in in-person events, right? Because we keep on talking about those days as if they happened Asian days many, many, many years ago. Uh, but hopefully they will come at some point. So are you up and ready for our topic, our fun topic today? Yeah. So, um, so today we're going to talk about... Um, Searching Azure Cosmos DB with Azure Cognitive Search. Um, what we will be doing is we will guide you through this uh, through this module. Um, you can scan the QR code. What we will do is we will guide you through um, some of the topics and then uh, wrap it up with a demo, um, which will yeah guide you through the entire setup and and be yeah a quite heavy one. Well. Uh, it will be a big one, so uh, it will take some time. I'm looking forward for that, actually, Glenn. Now, we do have some newcomers in our audience. I think it would be a good idea to actually start by introducing ourselves first and foremost. Do you want to start? Yeah, good. So my name is Glenn. I'm an uh, Azure MVP. I'm also a Microsoft Certified Trainer. Um, I work for a company called Jure. I built a cloud solution with um, Azure Platform as a Service and Cosmos DB. Uh, is one of those services I tend to use a lot. Uh, and also, um, recently, I've yeah, quite intensively started using cognitive search. So, uh, and I think this is my, uh, my cup of tea, so happy to be here. So, how about you? Tell us uh, who you are and what you do. Thank you so much for that. My name is Alex, Alex Mang for short. Uh, I am a fellow Microsoft Azure MVP, or put differently, a most valuable professional in the Azure Award category, as well as a regional director. And I do believe that this may sound like I am working for Microsoft, but I do want to rest people sure that neither Glenn nor myself work for Microsoft. In fact, both of these programs are programs for non-full-time employees at Microsoft. And I do share a passion with you, Glenn, both around Azure and at Cosmos DB quite a lot, because Cosmos DB is this very specific Azure service built natively in the cloud, isn't it? Yeah, and, and we are just, um, I think, at the end of uh, the Cosmos Conf, uh, the Cosmos DB Conf. So we're adding a, a session uh, today. I think it just ended a couple of hours ago, two days of Cosmos DB session. So if you uh, want to uh, review some of these sessions, I, I believe, you can easily find them um, on uh, Azure Cosmos DB Conf, um, which there were some great content over there. But we will add some more great content to this. <laughs> Absolutely, we sure will. And for, for everyone who wants to uh, rewatch or watch on demand the, the Azure Cosmos DB Conf content, everything is available on YouTube. But if you're watching live now, thank you for doing that. You might as well know that the recording of today's session will be available on YouTube as well. People yeah. might be streaming in actually from either YouTube, Twitch, Learn TV Live, Twitter, LinkedIn as well as I've just recently learned. And I do want to let people know that since this is live, if you have any questions, make sure you, you post them in the chat window on whatever platform you are. And our fantastic moderator, who today is Rodrigo Souza, will actually make sure to cover them. Rodrigo is a senior program manager on the Azure Cosmos DB team. And we do say hi to him and everyone else involved in putting together this fantastic event and a series of episodes, uh, principal program managers, program managers, producers, and everyone else who has been hard at work and whose faces you, do, you guys don't see on uh, all of these episodes. But we do share a passion with them, which is knowledge sharing, community, and obviously Cosmos DB. Good. With that being said, Let's remind everyone that we are actually following a Microsoft Learn module today. And this is a title just like our session today's title, Search Azure Cosmos DB SQL API Data 
with Azure Cognitive Search. Now, even though this is available, obviously, on Microsoft Learn completely for free, I do encourage you not to follow this whilst we are live streaming because we will share more tips and tricks and insights and data and, um, well, customer experience that we have learned over our over the years with our own experiences and with our customers' experiences around Cosmos DB and Azure Cognitive Search and whatnot. But I do encourage you, right, after the session, make sure to get your hands dirty, the deep dive into the Microsoft Learn content and make sure to get some additional experience. And obviously the purpose, both of this session and the Microsoft Learn content and her learning path in all fairness on Microsoft Learn is for you to get ready and get certified with the DP420 exam, namely the Microsoft Certified Azure Cosmos DB Developer Specialty. Hey, Glenn, did you get certified yet? Yes. Did you? <laughs> Good old. No, I, I think I, I briefly mentioned this last week. Uh, it, it was a pretty fun exam to do. It was quite challenging, but uh, it's always good to like um, uh, pick up new stuff while you're uh, learning for this exam. So, um, and uh, that brings you up to uh, bring with fresh ideas, bring you up to speed. So it's always good to study extra for these exams. And, and it was actually a fun exam to take uh, some, some, um, yeah, some pretty interesting questions, which we're not going to talk about, of course. Darn, I was just about to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> now, again, the learning objective today is to make sure that we understand what cognitive search is and also the concept of creating an indexer, whatever that is. For anyone who's new to a cognitive search, the concept of an indexer might be completely new. It has nothing to do with the indexes on a inverted tree that you might get with Cosmos DB, but something else. And we're going to talk about that. And how do you create an indexer to migrate the data from Azure Cosmos DB SQL APIs over to Azure Cognitive Search Index? And again, I don't think I am saying this enough times, but this session is live and interactive, and we definitely want to pick up your questions as well. Rodrigo will definitely do a fantastic job answering your questions, and we're going to pick some questions from the audience as well. So make sure to remain interactive. In fact, I would love to learn where people are stream, streaming in from. Are you from Romania, just like myself, or maybe from Belgium, just like Glenn, or maybe from the US? We would love to know that. So just say hi, come join us, and let's make sure that we keep this interactive. So today's session, as we have said, is going to be a fun one, right? Glenn, we're going to talk about Azure Cognitive Search. Have you ever used Cognitive Search outside of the sphere or the integration with uh, Cosmos DB? Yeah, actually, I've I've worked with Cosmos DB um, in 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 the case where there was like data within a blob storage and some uh, indexing was necessary on top of that. So, uh, so what uh, Azure Cos Cognitive Search is a, a a search. It's a platform as a service uh, service that provides you uh, capabilities um, to uh, to search. Um, natively uh, on top of data, so it can extract metadata uh, from 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 the data within within your storage account or within your Cosmos DB. It also gives you the uh, possibility or capabilities to um, to do uh, OCR uh, of images and stuff like that. I will talk about that during the demo later. Um, later and today. sorry and for the interruption, just to clarify, OCR, object character recognition, right? The concept yeah. of having a picture and out of pixels, understanding or determining characters and, and letters and digits and words and phrases and yeah. so on, right? For example, it can even uh, recognize um, uh, famous people. So if you, uh, if you put in like... Um, uh, movie posters and there's uh, a, a well-known guy, for example, uh, yeah, um, some some famous actor uh, in there. It will recognize that and will it will add that as metadata on top of your um, on top of your data, and this is being added into your cognitive search, which yeah. allows you to to yeah query the data that's in there and to to give you that uh, search experience that semantic search on top of your your data. Having so, done so many episodes on, on the Microsoft Learn Live TV by now, do you reckon it will recognize me as a famous person as well? I would say yes. I, I would oh. say you would definitely come up as a famous person by now. <laughs> if not, uh, we should put, do like some pull request or something to get you in there. 
I know, right? <laughs> Thanks for the vote of confidence there. So indeed, Azure Cognitive Search is this cloud-native PaaS service, as you have put it, um, which is all about implementing text-based semantic search within a service, right? And how, how, how would you describe this being different from writing a SQL where you're using the like function and the just use a bunch of percentage signs or asterisks or whatnot to replace a bunch of characters and just use a single word? Yeah, it's it's it gives you and and the team a more uh, rich experience, a more uh, rich search experience. Like you can do uh, autocomplete, you can do synonym matching. Um, that would, if you would try to implement this directly on top of your database in like uh, in SQL queries, that would be. Uh, extremely complex. So with Azure Search, that that um, that experience uh, is is brought to you and and gives you more a semantic or native search experience that you're used to. For example, when you're using uh, Bing or any other um, search engine. I think it is important for people, especially those who are familiar with, say, Elasticsearch, to tell them that Azure Search is actually a bit of a REST API wrapper on top of uh, the looks or the resemblances of, of, of an Elasticsearch. When I started using Cognitive Search back in the day, it was still in preview. And by the way, people might know, uh, as a fun fact, I'm, I'm going to share the story with you. Um, there was no, initially, there was no .NET client library that you would install as a Nougat package or whatnot to work with Azure Search. You would have to rely on writing your HTTP classes and HTTP clients yourself. So what I did, I think this was 2016 or 2017, is that I actually wrote a client library, which I literally called just that, Azure Search Client Library. And uh, I, sure enough, back in those days, I, I posted, I open sourced the code on CodePlex and I posted it on Nuget, uh, Nuget org, and it quickly became the most popular search client library and for some reason some people are still doing it i'm still getting downloads on it even though like three four years ago maybe i announced that i deprecated it because microsoft by that time made their own probably mm -hmm. official client library for the product it's a fantastic product i highly recommend it and my appreciation for the product particularly is on the fact that it has multiple dictionaries so for instance you you mentioned keywords right uh sorry synonyms but you might as well do a fuzzy search maybe you don't know how to um uh, how to correctly um uh, spell zucchini right some people yeah. use a double c some people use an h some people don't use an h some people type a z some people uh, write an s word or whatnot. um it, it to zucchini is a difficult difficult word but many many other words are difficult as well what cognitive search um, excels at is understanding what you what your actual intent is at, right? So you're typing in something, and as you've said, you have auto completion, but you also have yeah. recommendations. You have capabilities of highlighting pieces of text. You might put in multiple words separated by, say, a space. I might be searching for Glenn speaker at conferences and getting back a bunch of documents where you're being highlighted with a bunch of URLs, for instance. Uh, of various conference recordings that you might have had planned in the past. So it's effectively semantic-based, text-based search on top of what people might think of, well, frankly, just JSON documents. But initially, some people might remember Cognitive Search wasn't called Cognitive Search. Um, the reason for, my, for why my client library was called Azure Search Client Library is that the product name back in those days was Azure Search. And I do want to show people something, which in my opinion is something really, really cool. Namely, I'm going to open up um, a browser window somewhere. I know I have some a, a web browser somewhere open. I always have this issue where I forget where I'm putting my browser windows. Oh, here we go. So this is the web page for Cognitive Search, and hopefully everyone can see it. And uh, it's just on the typical Azure.com website where it explains what the product is and this and that. But one of the fantastic demos that they actually have is JFK files. So JFK files is actually a demo which is fully hosted on app services. You can tell that even by the uh, URL, azurewebsites.net, being the default host name for any app service in, in, in Azure. But it actually surfaces, or under the hood, it, 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 it's powered fully by Azure Cognitive Search. So what happened is that in 2018, when the JFK files were declassified, Microsoft pulled all of those files, which were tens of thousands of documents which were 
scans of paper and whatnot, which would be, as a human, impossible to go through and understand. And they simply took the data set, which was just pictures of documents and whatnot, and then they injected those in cognitive search. And it's interesting to see what they came up with. So if I, for instance, search for Oswald and hit the search button, you're going to get a bunch of words back, oh, sorry, a bunch of documents back of pictures with people, famous people, like you've mentioned previously. You can tell that there's no Oswald here, but this is Oswald, uh, yeah. the, the main uh, um, uh, incriminated uh, um, felon. Or we, we can tell that through these handwritten documents, there are some Oswald references, right? This is what Cognitive Search did for us. Uh, we can go back, maybe search in some uh, typewritten papers, again, pictures of documents, and you can tell that all of these documents are transcribed into text. And then our query actually ran against a large data set of these pieces of text right here. And everything you see here under the hood has the entire set of data exclusively on Cognitive Search. There's no other pieces of data. There's no other um, um, data repository or whatnot being utilized. And the data itself, where the indexer ran from, in this case at least, was uh, uh, was Blob Search uh, or Blob Storage, Azure Storage Accounts, Blob Services. Actually, I'm interested, Glenn. Maybe I can search for your name. Well, I, I was going to say, speaking of being uh, famous, maybe you should try searching for your name, but uh, let's try mine. That's okay. <laughs> well, I tried yours, and you definitely have several documents tagged here. And this is interesting because these are what they call in cognitive search facets, right? So they automatically create, think of them as categories. If you try to picture your most uh, popular, your favorite e commerce website, when you type in a product name, you typically get categories and subcategories on the left hand side of the page. Those are facets. Those are like dynamically generated categories based on the products that you have searched for and specifically the results that your keyword has returned. So tags, for instance, would be a facet, redaction, uh, redactions, whether the document was redacted or not, which is a simple Boolean here, yes and no. Um, but let's actually indeed search for my name, Alex. And they do have 42 different results. My name shows up several times, my first name at least. Uh, I'm not seeing my last name here, so I'm going to probably search for that as well. But obviously, you can look into these documents. And what's really, really, really interesting is that Cognitive Search even gives you the ability, if I click on this button, just bear with me here, to show you uh, the relationship between the various keywords, which are very, which are more frequently seen based on your keyword, right? So I search for Alex, for instance, and as I drag this one, you'll see that there are references wherever an Alex word comes in, where there is also mm -hmm. Alex and Fontaines, or Alex in California, or Alex and uh, Defontaine, or uh, Alex and Alexander, or Alex and Rourke, right? So these are other keywords that I might be interested in utilizing and um, further improving or enhancing my actual query. And then on the same website, if you actually click on this icon right here, which is the Azure Ser Cognitive Search icon, you're going to see how the design pattern actually was implemented. That's Honestly, it's just super simple. All the data, as I've said, was, has been pushed over blob storage. And then you have an Azure function, which is going to push some data over to Cosmos DB. And then your custom skill, which is uh, the CI crypto names and computer vision, specifically under Cognitive Services, the OCR, the handwriting, and the entity linking capabilities, have all been leveraged so that Azure Search can query these data um, sets and, well, present them into a nice, fashionable manner. Um, and yes, whenever I run a query, they're using the AZ Search JS library to query the data directly within Azure Search. So in my opinion, at least in my books, this is something really, really, really powerful. Um, have you ever used the JFK files demo, Glenn? No, actually, I wasn't uh, aware of that one. So it's mm. uh, it's pretty interesting to see the, the capabilities uh, uh, of of cognitive search on top of all these of all these data it's pretty interesting demo so uh, great to see it actually i i appreciate that and i do i do like that demo myself actually and there are many more demos obviously related to, to cognitive search but i do find this one to be a very pragmatic hands-on easy to relate to demo as well especially because of the large data set and as well as the fact that they are not pulling json documents which 
not necessarily easy, but they're, they would be straightforward to do a full text-based search on. They're actually getting pictures and then mm -hmm. they're, being, they're processing those pictures with a single service. Um, so I find that to be something really powerful. Now, yeah. I think it's interesting to even mention how this all works under the hood, right? How do you get that data maybe from your Cosmos DB account or from Blob Storage or wherever it is? How do you get it to actually work in, um, in Azure Search? So what do you think is the first step? So there's a couple of, of key components uh, which makes up for an indexer in, in Azure uh, Cognitive Search. First of all, and, and this, this data is uh, built from the ground up. First of all, you, of course, need a data source. So a data source that connects your, your uh, Azure Cognitive Search to uh, basically a different kind of um, uh, data platforms. Think of a storage account. Think of uh, Cosmos DB in our case. So it's it's really hooking up that data within your cognitive search. Right. Next to that, you have an uh, an indexer, and um, an indexer is basically your definition, or uh, it's the responsibility of the indexer to crawl the data from your data sources and insert them into what is called a your index. And your index mm -hmm. is um, a JSON document that is uh, searchable, which contains all the different um, data fields um, uh, that, uh, that came from your data source and the possibility uh, and the additional enrichments that has been done. I will, I will show you that later. So, for example, uh, if you pull data from a storage account, you can pull in the storage metadata, so the the um, the last time it was edited, the um, the, the path. But you can also um, take in other metadata or even do some enrichments on top of that, like uh, as already mentioned, uh, object recognition uh, and, and and so on. Um, Maybe another thing that I forgot to mention is that um, an indexer uh, runs at, at a specific interval. So it will, um, it will crawl your data um, if between the moment that your indexer started and restarts, documents are being added you will see those documents being added on top of your index. So it's really uh, filling up that index uh, uh, as soon as, as you go. Right. So effectively, in the case of Cosmos DB, you would yeah. configure a container as your data source, right? And then it's the per responsibility of the indexer um, to use that query that is pulling data from the container, as well as the frequency that you have just mentioned, for the purpose of crawling the data, because the indexer is effectively, like you have mentioned, just a crawler, right? And you create a target index. I know that we're abusing this word index, and it might be confusing because of that. Uh, but then you're going to create the target index, which is in the realm of cognitive search this time around. And the index there is where effectively we will have the searchable JSON documents being stored, right? Cool. So we have an index in the realm of cognitive service. Uh, search, which is all about where do you store the data that you're going to query using search. And then you have the concept of an index as a inverted tree in Cosmos DB and an indexer, which is pulling the data from the container in Cosmos DB, maybe using or not using an index, a composite index, a range index, doesn't matter, right? And then you actually have the index that I've said initially, which is the data that you're actually storing within search. Whenever you're running a query against Azure Cognitive Search, the data will be queried directly from, from that index in the realm of Cognitive Search. I, I know we were abusing this word, but hopefully we, we could clarify um, where this index thingy comes in and how, how it refers to different things or features or capabilities depending on the technology you're working with. Good. So I guess the first step is having a data source, right? Having a data source, but I'm not necessarily referring to provisioning a Cosmos DB account, but rather configuring a data source from where you're pulling the data. In this case, that would be the data, uh, the, the Cosmos DB container, but you want to pull the data. So you need a data source where you're specifying, hey, here's my container. And this data source is something that the indexer will use. How do you do that? I guess you're going to use some connection strings, right? 
Yeah, you you uh, so the first step um, is that you need a connection string. You need the name of your uh, target database and the name of your target container. Uh, mm -hmm. As already mentioned, we're not going to um, to uh, show you how to or to create and set up a a Cosmos DB database and co and uh, and collection. That is definitely handled within the module itself. So. Um, at the end of the, the module, there's a, a demo that spins up a VM for you and everything explained is over there to where, how you can set up a database and collection, but we're not going to talk about, um, about that today. So, but in all fairness, um, we do have an episode where we actually go through the processes yes. of provisioning a Cosmos DB account and explaining all the various topics and conversations. This was the very first episode that both you and me did actually back in December mm -hmm. last year. Yeah, and, and, and I definitely encourage everyone to go and watch that one. So, um, uh, and there we explain how to, to set up these things and what is important when you create a, a collection and, and stuff like that. So, uh, here we assume that everything is uh, um, good to go and that you can just hook up your uh, Azure Cognitive Search within an existing uh, database and collection. Um, what is uh, special is that you can definitely specify a query that um, allows you to um, to specify the the items to be uh, to be indexed. Right. So on that connection string, I think it's also worth mentioning that you get two different options of using the connection string. You even get to use the connection string like the full access connect connection string. And you could get a connection string, obviously, from the Cosmos DB account page if you head over to the uh, key section in the Azure portal. Um, and that's just the left navigation pane I'm referring to. And then you just make sure to select the full connection string, not leaving out anything out of it. And then you would just use this in your data source. But alternatively, you could also use when this connection string doesn't require an account key, um, you can use a managed identity instead. And then the connection string format changes a bit, but as long as you have a role assignment that grants the Cosmos DB account reader role permission, then your, your um, um, cognitive search capability or service could actually pull the data from Cosmos DB without actually passing on that pesky account key that otherwise has full privilege and full access to, to even manage the Cosmos DB account. You have mentioned previously something on using queries when you're running your, your indexers or your data sources. Want to maybe elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, so um, so in the in the query property, when you uh, are specifying uh, your your connection, you can specify a, a query. Uh, in our case, it's a it's a SQL query because we're using the, the SQL API to like um, flatten nested properties or arrays. You can um, project JSON properties. Uh, do some filtering on the data uh, that you want to be indexed and so on. So it really gives you full control uh, on the fields and the, the the things that will show up in within your uh, within your uh, cognitive search index, allowing you to yeah to to tweak uh, your um, your index, allowing you to like uh, adding the things that matter for your application or for your users. Uh, in there, and then having like uh, within your Cosmos DB, adding the 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 other stuff that that you don't query uh, that often, or that you um, that you need uh, on on the side, actually. Right. When when you're writing that query, I think it's also worth mentioning here that there are multiple types of queries that you could write. You could have this filter query as you have it here, where you're just selecting a bunch, but you have a predicate where you're limiting down, for instance, the company being Microsoft for the JSON document that you see above, uh, where we have a bunch of people, employees with their user identifiers or contacts. In this case, Alice uh, would be working for Microsoft. And then you also have the TS system attribute that we're going to talk about momentarily. But alternatively, sometimes you want to have a different uh, a different kind of a query, like a flattening query, like this one right here, where rather than pulling everything, you're just pulling some data, and you're going to use this data 
for actually pushing it over to your index in Cognitive Search. Or alternatively, you may have a projection query where the data format and data structure, as you have it right now in Cosmos DB, doesn't match the type of properties or attributes that you want to have in um, Cognitive Search. So you may do a projection where you're changing the property names. For instance, the first name that would be a property of an object property in, in Cosmos DB, contact first name, uh, can simply show up as name, for instance, in, in your Cognitive Search index. And alternatively, or similarly, the company could be part of a different uh, um, object or part of a different property name in Cognitive Search in, in Cosmos DB, and you may have it uh, put differently in co on Cognitive Search. Cognitive Search, or you might have an array flattening query like this one right here, where you're joining with tags, and then you're using this information because you want those tags to be flattened together as a comma-separated list, for instance, within your Azure Cognitive Search service. So, and once you have your uh, data source configured with the uh, with the connection string database collection and or query, um, you need to create an um, an uh, index. So, and that index minimally contains like a name and a key, and the key refers to like a unique identifier uh, field that that is within each uh, JSON document. Next to that, uh, there's a couple of uh, features or options that you can uh, select, uh, allowing you to, uh, to add extra functionality uh, on specific fields uh, where, it, where it makes sense. Um, so uh, you will see this also within the demo, but for each field that is uh, within your uh, documents that are pulled in, you can uh, select one of one or multiple of these features. So the retrievable um, uh, means that it, it allows or it configures the fields to be available within the uh, search results set. Filterables, of course, um, make uh, speaks for itself. It allows uh, filtering within, uh, within that field. Uh, sortable allows sorting. Um, Phase table, as I think Alex mentioned that um, previously during this uh, session, it allows uh, fields to be grouped together, uh, for example, within a category uh, and, and be dynamically uh, aggregated. And searchable allows um, yeah, search credits to match terms in this field. So, uh, so depending on what your field or what your um, how you want your index to look like, uh, adding these features uh, to your fields uh, um, is, is, is pretty uh, important. For example, if you know that you need to sort on, on something that is uh, in, your, in your table, uh, definitely add it as sortable. Of course, it's always um, adjustable uh, afterwards, but it's, uh, it's good to have that um, uh, started or configured from, uh, from the get-go. But you know, Glenn, maybe we can spend a minute here explaining the differences between these features because they might be confusing to some. Uh, at least they were for me initially when I used the entire, when I developed the entire Azure Search uh, client library. Because uh, saying that something is searchable or something is filterable might not be completely um, comprehensive at the, uh, at the beginning. But, and therefore, I think it is important to say that when we specify a property as being searchable, that means that whatever query you're typing in, by default, we're going to search for that data within every single searchable property of every single data point or entry or document that you have in your index and cognitive search, right? So if, for instance, you have one piece of text, just whatever string representing, say, for instance, the country an event happens and our index contains a bunch of events around the world. Um, if you're typing for something, you might not actually type the, count, the country or the, uh, the, the, the city name, but that might be something that you want to be querying data against. Or maybe you want to query on the location of the physical event so that it's closer to your location rather than something further away. I do not expect people to query for latitude and longitude, but rather maybe for the event name or their favorite team or their favorite venue or something along those lines. So searchable is important because it, it's going to minimize the actual resource consumption when you're running a query. 
if you want something to be filtered so that you only search for data that happens or for events that happen in the neighborhood in your whereabouts maybe of a different of a specific category then that particular uh property would be configured as filterable and this allows you not to use the query um index or body itself but use a different property a different method mm -hmm. on the data that you're going to run to ensure that you're filtering you're running a predicate just like a where clause in in your in your selects for instance and there are some more like we we have mentioned festable how do you create those that automatic dynamic uh, categories effectively uh filterable filterable i've already mentioned that one sortable retrievable retrievable is interesting i use this a lot sometimes i have some things that i want to query and maybe my data is private or public and i don't want to make that information publicly available to everyone so i'm just using that as a as a as a as a control key effectively or maybe i'm using that as a flag of sorts i don't want to make that property feel retrievable i don't i don't want to expose that information to people so i'm just going to use that in a filter so that particular property will be filterable and, re and retrievable none or false effectively good now with that being said i also uh, find this to be quite interesting because the moment you want to add your search fields to an index in a search index you're adding fields to like accept the source json documents or even the output of your custom um, query projections so you ensure that search index is compatible with your source data and for the content in cosmos db your search index schema should always correspond to the cosmos db items in your data source so the the typical steps that you have is that you first create or update the index to define the search fields that you will store the data this is effectively i'm creating the structure in cost in cognitive service right this is what i'm doing then the second step is that you're creating a document key field um this is like specifying which is the identifier right when you have partition collections in cosmos db the default document key is going to be the azure's cosmos db built-in property called rid which azure cognitive search automatically renames to rid without an under uh, underscore um, as a prefix because the field names can never start with an underscore character in cognitive search right so we already see a lack of compatibility there but this happens automatically automatically i would say uh, without you having to worry too much about it. And also, Azure Cosmos DB RID values contain a character that is invalid in other uh, search keys. And for this reason, all the values in the RID value itself actually ends up being base64 encoded. And people, when I talk to them, are confused, like, this is not my RID. Yes, it is, but it's base64 encoded. Hence, it's longer and it looks different. And then the third step would be that you would create any additional fields for more searchable content if you need to. But talking about this mapping between your JSON data and your Cosmos DB and Cognitive Search, we do actually have a slide here that's not going to show up in your Microsoft Learn module. So if you want, maybe just pause this, take a moment, take it in, breathe it in. But long story short, um, there are data types which are similar, but you need to be mindful about, say, numbers that look like integers. There are a handful of options there in Cognitive Search or numbers that look like a floating point number. There are a couple of options for that one as well. And last but not least, Glenn, when, when you're adding stuff in your cognitive service, do you expect it to be automatically available? Because the operation fees is super fast, right? Yeah, and um, as already mentioned, when you add stuff to your data source, it, there's an indexer running. Um, and that's uh, every uh, X amount of, I think it's the, the smallest time it can automatically run is three minutes um uh, if i'm not Might mistaken be, yeah, so, yeah I, I i'm taking this with a grain of salt i don't i honestly am bad with numbers at this point um might be three minutes but it might be a different one i'm, I'm pretty sure it's documented probably. yeah so it, it, there's a fixed amount of of uh minimum of of minutes that there's in between like two um indexer run uh, what is possible, uh, you can like monitor the indexer status, uh, uh, query if it's running, you can uh, query the last result. So how many documents uh, that have been added to the index, uh, what, what happened, uh, did, it, um, did it complete successfully, uh, and so on. Um, so, and it also gives you like a, an execution history 
So uh, if you want, you can uh, query uh, up to 50 um, uh, completed executions uh, uh, back to see what has happened, how many documents that have been added, um, and, and to see yeah, how, how your, your indexes um, uh, how your indexers uh, have have done or how it added documents. So if there's items that have failed uh, to be added uh, and so on. So this is pretty interesting to see um, how many documents are being added on a on a time uh, timed interval uh, on top of your on top of your index. And the execution history comes, correct me if I'm wrong, in a reverse chronological order, right? So it's always going yeah. to be the most recent last 50, effectively. You have another one, the 51th in the past, starting now, um, it will no longer show up. It's going to be always less 50 that, that we're, we're at it in the reverse chronological order. Yeah, so do remind me that we take a peek at that execution history when we're, uh, we're doing the demo. Yeah, definitely. Let's do that. Uh, I think we're just getting there towards the demo, right? Um, once we have the data and the connection strings and uh, the index created, and then we're creating the query and everything, we're just going to configure the indexer, which is, I believe, the final step where we're just configuring the name and schedule. The frequency effectively will be given here. And then the data will be fed in our Cognitive Search service. But sometimes the data changes in Cosmos DB. So how do we handle that, Glenn? Yeah, so um, uh, I, I believe we, we've mentioned that already during, uh, during specifying the query. So it's important that, um, uh, that the query that you're using to index your, your documents within your uh, Cosmos DB uh, is uh, using the where clause, where you're, you're actually calling or querying uh, within the, the timestamp property. And uh, yeah, of course, it should be greater or equal to the built-in high, uh, high watermark field. So um, the high watermark field just comes in from a built-in change detection policy that attempts to um, yeah, identify or identifies whether an item has been changed, uh, yes or no. So um, to to yeah to accomplish that change detection, the indexer will uh, will just re uh, will index all the items returned by the query, and then it will store the the timestamp as the high watermark. So and then the next indexer run um, will index items that uh, have a, a greater timestamp than the ones that already um, been uh, been indexed before. So the entire magic actually happens around this underscore TS, which is your timestamp property, yep, which correct. whenever it is greater or equal to a built-in high watermark field, you know that, hey, we have some changes we, which we have to be pulled in, right? So in order to accomplish this change detection, what do we simply do? I guess we're just telling the indexer to uh, index all the items that are returned by the query, but the query itself is where the magic happens because we're only querying for data where the timestamp is higher than the high watermark value, right? So it stores the timestamp as a high watermark, and then the next time the indexer runs, it just pulls the differences out. Everything that's new or anything that's updated effectively because of the timestamp property, which is, again, built in in Cosmos DB. We don't have to worry about that. Um, so that's something that worked out quite nicely, I would say, for the teams. Uh, to integrate the two products together. But what if we delete stuff? If we delete stuff, we're no longer going to have any timestamps whatsoever. How do we handle that? So if an item is, is deleted from, uh, from a container in Cosmos DB, from your storage account, or, or from anything else, um, it's it may not be deleted from your uh, from your uh, from your index in Azure in your cognitive search because that item has been stored or has been added to your index within your cognitive search. So um, what you need to do is um, you of course this is something that uh, that you need to do I wouldn't say uh, manually but you need to have like uh, implement what is called a, a soft delete. Uh, so um, you can uh, 
yeah, if just looking at this example, we have an, an, an is deleted, which is the value is true. Using this soft delete policy uh, allows you to um, to uh, to use this, and then Azure Cognitive Search will or can remove items that have been soft deleted uh, from uh, from your container. So it's um, it's it, it allows you to to gracefully uh, remove those items from uh, from within your uh, from within your index. So effectively, typical programmatic approach have an extra property there. I is deleted, and as soon as that one turns true, we know that this one was a soft delete, and it will uh, it will have to be purged away. Are we ready to see some code? Yes, I guess so. <laughs> so um, let's um, jump uh, before we jump into the uh, complete configuration of setting up an index uh, within uh, in combination with Cosmos DB, I want to show you something that is already pre-configured on, on my end. Uh, and we've talked about um, uh, OCRing uh, images uh, and so on uh, during the beginning. So what I have is, um, and sorry for, um, for not talking about uh, Cosmos DB, but I definitely want to show this. So what I have is I have a storage account which um, contains um, movie posters. Uh, let me see if I can uh, take that up here. It's, um, yeah, so that's a bad example. So it's it's images uh, from, from movie posters. And what I've did when, within Cognitive Search is uh, I've added those as a as a data source, and within my uh, indexer, if I take a look at uh, that one, uh, you can see that I've um, that I've uh, you see here the execution um, uh, policies that we've talked about. Let me just uh, go back here. Um, if we would go to the index, you will see that there's a couple of fields here. And it you will also see like image tags, image caption, and image celebrities. And those are um, those are fields that are being added by uh, cognitive search uh, during configuration uh, of that. And it will OCR these images and uh, extract tags, extract celebrities from it, extract captions from it. And if I now, go I, to... I, I think that the, there is one point worth mentioning here, because if people do not configure their indexes correctly when in Cognitive Search, when they set it up initially, as in they forget that something has to be sortable, or maybe they forget that something has to be festable, the index has to be recreated. The only one property that you can change after the fact, after you have created the index, is the retrievable property, but correct me if I'm wrong. Everything else, and that's the reason why they show up as disabled, is that they were not picked as, um, sorry, they cannot be changed after you create the index. So if you have not picked something to be filterable, then you got to stick to that. And recreating the index, if you have some data inside, also means that you need to move the data as well. So this is not an easy, easy ask, right? You really have to plan this accordingly. Yeah, correctly. So and and just to 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 wrap up this uh, small sidetrack, if I uh, uh, search, if I open up the uh, the uh, explorer here, you will see here that uh, there's a lot of metadata being extracted from uh, from this image. You see, probably there's some some dinosaur in this image. In this case, there's. Uh, you can see here Nicolas Cage has have been extracted uh, from that. So it's really pretty interesting to see uh, what what type of data that is being extracted from just adding uh, adding images um, uh, to that to that storage account. But uh, that's not what we're here for. We're here to work with with Cosmos DB. So let's uh, take a look at. Um, how our Cosmos DB looks like. 
So we have a um, Cosmos DB account which contains um, which contains uh, JSON documents with metadata around movies. In our case, uh, this example is Captain America: Winter Soldier has been uh, by Marvel Studios released in 2014. You and what I've did right? um, as uh, another part of uh, another demo is the extraction of the movie posters. I've added this to uh, to this Cosmos DB uh, document and basically enriched this metadata document with the OCR images that are coming from, uh, from Cognitive Search. Of course, when you are in the case of building, uh, imagine that you want to build a, a, a semantic search on top of this. So uh, um, people want to search for action movies or I want to search for Marvel movies. It is uh, difficult to write um, or to, to provision your data around, around those types of, of, of queries. Uh, I think it was a couple of weeks ago where we talked about that uh, adding a, a partition key or partitioning your data within within Cosmos DB resolves is, is pretty important to avoid uh, cross partition queries and so on. So imagine if you would uh, have to query um, data like I want to have a movie with with aliens and monsters. So imagine yeah. building a performant Cosmos DB query around that. That would be uh, impossible. Uh, well. It would be possible, but it would be uh, not that performant. And this is where where actually um, cognitive search comes into play to to have that more rich uh, search experience on top of uh, data within within Cosmos DB. Indeed, do you already so, have this data in your cognitive search as well? Sorry, do you already have this data indexed in cognitive search? No, I, I, I'm I'm taking the the brave route here, so I'm I'm going to do uh, a live demo and try to add it yeah. live on stage. <laughs> so bear with me. <laughs> Let's do that. So, um, what do you remember from our our talk a couple of minutes ago? So, what is the first thing that you need to do um, uh, when you? Uh, when you would do this uh, or so define the would... index right define the index would be the first one once you have your index you would define your data source and then with your data source with your index set i guess you would just make sure and you configure your indexer yeah correct so let's start by first importing our our data right mm -hmm. so let's um choose cosmos db and um what I because this of course this is done through the portal, but you can uh, automate that uh, with uh, within your um, within your bicep files or using the REST API to configure your your data sources, your indexes, and so on. So let's uh, choose an existing connection, uh, our movies uh, database. So let's call this demo um, Cosmos. Or let's do it learn live dash cosmos db. So, uh, and let's choose our uh, MVP movies database and our collection just movies. And here, what I will do is, uh, as, as I've mentioned here, if you can start by specifying uh, the query, you can see here that we have the high uh, watermark in order to. Um, to have the, the time uh, stamp tracking for tracking purposes, I suggest to, to leave that um, query uh, as default. So once we're, um, once we're good to go, let's start by adding uh, cognitive skills. So what, as you can see here, um, what it did um, while connecting to our data source, it it uh, did uh, a schema uh, recognition or try to uh, search fields within within our documents to to have in order to make sure that we can do some uh, customization on our indexes 
to see if there's specific uh, fields that needs to be uh, searchable uh, or uh, retrievable or queryable. So um, the next thing you can do is add cognitive skills. So uh, you can do uh, enrichments, uh, as already said, you can uh, extract people names, extract organization names, uh, and so on. You can even translate text if you want, uh, and so on. And um, this is just uh, adding enrichments on top of your already existing data within your within your Cosmos DB. Uh, you can attach uh, cognitive ser uh, services. Then you need a, a cognitive uh, service resource, and the cognitive service resource is a set of APIs that uh, allows you to do to have those AI capabilities uh, on top of your uh, documents. So let's maybe skip the enrichments for now and um, skip to customizing our, our target index. And here we're in the, uh, within, the, within the portal or within the, um, within the configuration of your, our index. So let's give our index a name. Uh, I think we've mentioned that uh, you need a key field, and this is a, a key um, field within the index, and it's a unique identifier for each of your document that is stored within uh, within the uh, within the index. So next uh, next to that is you. Um, because we uh, connected our data source, uh, Azure Cognitive Search uh, automatically um, recognized uh, our, uh, our document structure and uh, uh, is giving a suggestion from field names that he has found and the type of those specific, uh, uh, specific fields. In this uh, in this portal or in this in this blade, we can actually start defining um, our uh, how our index should look like. So, um, do we want the fields to be uh, retrievable? Do we want them to be uh, filterable? Do we allow to have uh, sorting on them um, uh, and so on and so on? So, and remember uh, that many of these properties can only be set once. At this point, if you, if you haven't configured them, then you're going to stuck effectively with the index as you have configured it right now. Uh, so that's that's an important aspect. Again, it's not an easy pick. It's not an easy choice. So I, I think we we've talked briefly around that. Only the retrievable retrievable yeah. wow well, uh, retrievable is uh, changeable after uh, you've created the index. So it's uh, it's important to have that. Um, that thing uh, defined, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, on top of uh, for that. So let's, um, I think it's important for the rest of the demo that it's retrievable. Let's uh, add the, uh, the searchable and then I would, let's make it filterable here on the rating. Um, let's me just, and here and so and as already mentioned it's it's important that uh, these things are set up front in order for you to to allow uh, you to uh, to yeah to fully customize your your index where where necessary so the next step uh, once we've set this up we have our fields defined we have uh, configured the fields to be projected in the search result, uh, allow search queries to match the, the fields within with searchable. We've added a couple of fields that are filterable. So we're ready to start creating our indexer. So here again, the indexer is something that runs on a, on a, on a schedule base. You can uh, choose to run it um, uh, once hourly, daily, or, or, or custom. Uh, and I think we've, I, let me see. So, okay. So it's not three minutes, but five minutes. Uh, five minutes. Yeah, that's here, the least, uh, and that's going to be the default, I guess, as well. Sorry? 
that's going to be your least value that you can configure. So we were wrong previously, um, but always good to be proven right or wrong by the portal, right? <laughs> uh, I guess I owe you a, a drink, right? No worries, no worries. It's all good. However, there's a, a workaround for this. Um, there's an API, or you can use the SDK to manually call this uh, this indexer um, in order to uh, trigger it at your uh, your own interval. However, be aware that uh, if an indexer is running already, you cannot uh, trigger it, and you will get an error once if you call it uh, uh, manually. So let's. Just... I, I think it's also worth mentioning here that people should not be confused that the indexer will just pull the data, right? Because it's at the end of the day, it's just another client, which implies that it will consume our use, it will consume connection points, it will consume everything there is to be consumed from Cosmos DB, just like any other client. So even if you were to enforce it to execute even more often, it would just increase the RU consumption on your Cosmos DB account. So is there really a lot of value into adding a document and trying to have it in less than five minutes already um, retrievable, searchable, sortable, yada, 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 in whatever you're searching for. Because many times when you're searching for something, there is an expectation that things are not in real time. So that five minutes, in my opinion, is a, is a decent value. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've never, never uh, experienced that it, it should be um, be lower than, than five minutes, uh, actually. So, uh, so let's... Um, I think we're good to go, right? Yeah, looks like so, it. So let's uh, let's submit and see what happens. So we get the um, the message that our indexes was created successfully. Um, still validating. And if all goes well, we should see an end. Okay, so we have um, the import is configured successfully. Um, and what we can do here is uh, move over to the indexer. And you can see here that uh, our Cosmos DB uh, indexer was uh, created. However, the index, uh, the last run is never. So if we click it open, you can see here in the meanwhile, while we did uh, the talk over, the, um, the indexer ran successfully. You can see here that the, the documents that were added to the index were 401. It's actually the number of documents that were inside my, my, um, my Cosmos uh, DB. Um, so if I would now uh, do a run again, so it's a manual trigger of that index, you would see that, um, that it would start running. Um, again, the indexer ran successfully. Um, there's no uh, document succeeded because we did not add documents uh, to our Cosmos DB in the, in the meanwhile. But you can see here, um, there's a history of that indexer being built up. And as we've mentioned during the, the slides, it's, it builds up until around uh, 50. So you can really start digging into the the history of that of that index. So um, if we move back to the um, search service, I think the most important thing to show is the actual um, um, the actual index. So if we click that open, so you would see here that you have a built-in search explorer. Uh, allowing you to do some uh, queries on top of the, your your index being created. In real in a real time application, what would happen is you would of of course directly use this request URL to query the data that's uh, within your within your index. So if we just uh, add nothing to the query string and click on search, you would see that already. Um, you can see different values that are being added um, within our um, within our index, and you can see that these um, uh, have similar or are actually uh, the fields from Cosmos DB are added here within our within our uh, index. 
So what we can do uh, as a query string, for example, we can search for action movies. All goes well. You could see that um, uh, fields will come back uh, or, or documents will come back that have some kind of mentioning on action within within the entire document. For for example, here there's an uh, action film within the uh, image tags. There's um, the main genre is is action. So this basically brings up uh, or a decent uh, search score. And I, I I don't think we've uh, we've talked about the search score, right? Uh, no, we haven't. But I think it's important to mention here because every results would actually be returned based on the search score. And this is a value that is automatically calculated depending on a bunch of various um, uh, facets. So for example, remember that searchable criteria. Now, if you're searching for a keyword and that keyword has a higher frequency in that particular property and in that particular document in comparison to others, the score will increase. But if you have that one word within a very long phrase, its importance, so to say, is going to be minimized and therefore its score will be, uh, will be minimized as well. But you could alternatively use what is known in cognitive search as a booster. So yeah. if, for instance, one property contains a word and that property is more important if the word appears in, say, the name of something rather than the description of something, you can boost that particular uh, property, say the name, by whatever value you want. And this will obviously impact the score that your result will get as well. Yeah. So and, and to to do some more things. So we can search for like um, for like Marvel and then uh, every movie that contains or has a link with Marvel will will come back here. So the Avenger is coming uh, is, is popping up. Um, Spider-Man is a Marvel character. It's popping up. So Captain America here. So and what you can do um, next to that is you can also start um, adding some um, some uh, filters on top of that or adding stuff within your uh, within your query string. For example, let us say I want the top two of those those things coming back, and then you would see here that you you would see only the top two of those um, those um, results uh, being uh, shown. And I, if I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, if we do um, like Marvel, and I mm, think I've mentioned something like uh, you can do filtering on on top of that. Can and can then, you do me a favor? I'm I'm getting a bit old. Can you maybe zoom into 125 or something like that uh, in your browser? I just want to quickly look at the URL as well because I'm seeing some interesting facets there and now you're using a filter so this is old data that you're writing here right yeah i was i was going to mention so the the filtering is a uh, old data style filtering on on specific fields so what i'm doing here is i'm saying okay i want to search for marvel and um i want to um i want to filter maybe let's uh, i think it's uh this kind of um um, I want to filter on saying let let us say that uh, I think I've mentioned the 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 rating as filterable. So let me add that one, and then I, I want it greater than. Take a peek. I want it greater than than eighty. So and if we hit search there, you would see all the uh, Marvel. Uh, movies or marvel uh, results uh, coming back where the the, the rating is uh, bigger than than 80 so let's so we have 81 82 and 81 so i'm 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 confident that these are 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 within the the result well done so um and what is maybe more an an an, an, an interesting an interesting thing is um, we've now done uh, very specific, um, very specific um, queries, um, uh, queries uh, within within our 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 
our index. But what we can do is do like a more semantic search and do something like, hey, I want a movie that um, with some, uh, with uh, let us say aliens and monsters. And if we hit that, um, you would uh, see some results uh, coming back like uh, Monsters University, which is kind of a movie with, with aliens and monsters. You have the Muppet movie, which is an edge <laughs> case, I guess. And then um, uh, Monsters Inc., uh, Super U Uperman. I think this is missing an S somewhere. So Superman is an alien. So and and you can see next to like filtering on on specific things, you can really do semantic search within your your index uh, here. So and this allows you. Uh, to, to really create that rich uh, search uh, experience. Nice. And I think that's uh, I think that's um, that shows you how to connect uh, Cosmos DB, your data source, uh, create an index, create an indexers, and show you how to query that index with with uh, with filters and and really doing a semantic search. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, on top of that data, which otherwise, if you would have to um, uh, create a specific query on that within Cosmos DB, would uh, pretty much consume uh, lots of uh, our use. Nice. Great job, Glenn. Fantastic demo. I love it. I, I just learned like we can literally enhance the experience our customers are getting with the data that we're assisting Cosmos DB literally through the portal, just a bunch of clicks and 20 minutes of explanation and you're done. <laughs> <laughs> but it's definitely is like a super th quick thing because coming to think of it, you just selected your data source. You already had your connection there, right? It will probably take you extra 15 seconds to set up the connection. You selected a bunch of properties for the indexer uh, for the index and that was it. Yeah. Nice. How about some knowledge check questions? That's always a, a challenging thing, but let's let's do that. And I, I would definitely encourage uh, everyone to uh, to join us for this one. Um, I think you can uh, scan the QR code or go to aks.ml slash um, uh, polls and you can uh, join us and, and 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 start voting around these these questions. So, Definitely uh, up for some knowledge check in this one. Absolutely. I'm going to read out loud the first one. To enable the ability to index changes in Azure Cosmos DB SQL API items, which field should you include in the data sources SQL query? Well, interesting. So the first one says partition key A, B, I, D, or C underscore T, S. Well, here's my thinking to this one. Partition key, obviously, is a property that always exists. It is there by, by design. We can use it to create our logical partition que, uh, um, partition, part, partitions that we have talked about in the previous episode. And this to an extent has some sort of a influence on the, on the physical partitions created in Cosmos DB as well. But index changes, I mean, the fact that something changes doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to change its partition. So I would not go with this one. As with the identifier, the fact that the data changes in a document in Cosmos DB doesn't imply that the identifier will change, and therefore the identifier should not be enough or would not be enough. So TS is where my money goes because underscore TS, TS stands for time timestamp. It is one of those properties in Cosmos DB that automatically gets um, get added to your document, and every time there is an update or there or document is created the timestamp value will be updated or will be appended or created there um, respectively. So I would go with C, TS. What about you? Yeah, I would I would definitely go to uh, towards the, the TS and, and join you at, at that one. It's um, I think we, we've talked about this is where the high watermark policy uh, comes in uh, into play. Um, 
So, uh, and I, I do notice that um, a couple of people on the on the vote uh, actually selected the the correct uh, answers for this one. So, uh, I thank you everyone for for uh, for joining us on on the on the live questions. It's always great to see uh, many interactions um, uh, within within the within these polls. So, so thank you. So. How about we jump to the next one? Yeah, let me read this one out loud as well. Your yeah. Azure Cosmos DB SQL APS solution regularly uses the time to live value to automatically delete items after a set amount of time. Which strategy should you use to ensure that the deleted items are also deleted in the search index? A, configure a soft delete policy with tracked column and value. B, no configuration required because Azure Cognitive Search will automatically remove the data from the index. Or C, configure a high watermark policy that is mapped to a timestamp field. Well, I definitely know that we have talked about this, right? Yeah. So it's only a matter of making sure that um, we will know uh, which one to correct here as well, collect here as well. But here's my thinking to it. So configuring a high watermark policy that is mapped to the timestamp field, sure. But this only does... Um, um, a checkup on whatever change that ever uh, that ever occurred from the context of a Cosmos DB account. If I purge the data, the document, right? If I vanish it, there's no longer going to be a TS property on the document because the document is missing, right? So this is not going to help us in any way whatsoever. Um, no. On, on B, no configuration required. Azure Cognitive Search will automatically remove the data from the index. Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, <laughs> that would be actually, you know what, Th this reminds me of something that I think is valuable. If you ever configure a time to live on your Cosmos DB document, the document does automatically get removed, but the document will not be removed from Cognitive Search. So this is something that people have to be, you know, to be careful with, because there is a risk that if you apply a TTL on your data in Cosmos DB, the data re gets removed, and then you type, start typing something in, in search, in a, like a text box or something. You get suggestions, you get results, you click on the result, and boom, it takes you to a 404. There's no such document. So you've got to be mindful and uh, careful with that. Or is it A, configure a self-delete policy with a tracked column and value? Well, this is what I would do. I'm a programmer at heart. This is how I, how, how I would handle things. I would have some sort of a field, a property of sorts, where a Boolean value would, might just do, where I would say is deleted equals true, means that I have stopped deleted that value, so that has to be removed out of um, my context search index as well. Glenn, what do you think? Yeah, I... Um... I'm here with, uh, if I look at the results from the poll, I'm here with, uh, with the crowd to, to say to configure a, a soft delete policy with, um, with the tracked column uh, and, and the value. I think we've, we've mentioned that, that you can actually specify that within the, uh, within the indexer, um, indexer configuration. So, I'm I'm following the the people on the live stream here, and and I definitely going for A. Fantastic, and that is actually the correct answer as well. Great stuff. Wonderful. I guess I guess everyone paid a lot of attention, so and that's great because over the past what is it, 18 minutes or so, we actually talked about what cognitive search is. We talked about creating an indexer. We talked about data sources and connection strings and everything there is to hook up your Cosmos DB account with cognitive search. So now people know that it's so that easy just to add an additional layer and improve the overall experience users are getting by having full text-based semantic search with fuzzy search, with synonyms, with boosters, with everything else there is, um, all coming from um, Azure cognitive search. Fantastic. So yeah, so if you want to learn more or or give give the give the demo a try, uh, just we would invite you to to go to the module and 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 run through all the details that we've talked about today. And there, at the end of that that module, you will be able to to do a demo where you will create a Cosmos DB and you will create a cognitive search service 
that will index your data and uh, will guide you through some of the, the querying and the topics that we've talked about today. So if you want to learn more, um, you can go and uh, visit the module. You can use the QR code or the link within uh, within the slides. And if I may, if people want to learn more and keep the conversation going, even offline, make sure that you head over here to this Twitter name, Twitter handle, or this one right here. And we're more than happy to actually connect with you and stay in touch. If you have any questions, any preparation questions for, for the exam, any tips and tricks on how to nail that exam and pass it from, from your first shot, we'll be more than happy to assist you in your overall learning process. And again, it has been a pleasure for me, Glenn, to, to co-host with you again in such a short time. You're, you're a fantastic host, and so and I thank you so much for, for um, handling this one today as well. The the pleasure was was all, all, all mine, so definitely. So um, before we go again, uh, go to the live, um, to the learn module, and um, what we're here for uh, all in the end is to, to get uh, certified for the uh, Azure Cosmos DB developer specialty. Um, it's... It, um, it, it measures your ability to do uh, to do amazing things with with Cosmos DB. With that said, um, one thing I've learned yeah. before we wrap up, one thing I've learned is that all of these certifications that people are are are, are collecting almost feels like Pokemon to an extent, right? You're getting this one and that one. What are what is the value in that one? In my personal experience with my peers, with my colleagues, and with the people that I constantly teach with my students. I see them stand out of the crowd. The IT crowd is so vast, so large. A lot of people want to get into it as well. I highly encourage people to to get to get and uh, to get stuff and learn more. But getting certified definitely puts you out of the crowd. You you stand out. And all of these videos, they're just preparation materials. We want you to watch them. We want you to go through the recordings, but we also want you to get your hands dirty and walk and go through the material at your own pace for Microsoft Learn. Remember. Everything is completely free, gratis, nada, you name it, put it like you want. Everything you have to do is just have a Microsoft account, which you probably already have when you have set up your Windows 11 device uh, or your Outlook account or your Hotmail account or your Xbox account, your Skype account, you name it. You just have to sign in with that and you're going to get start claiming some experience points. You're going to start accumulating more knowledge and putting that knowledge into practice is just getting the exam, passing the exam for your certification. Good. All right. Um, with that said, I want to thank you, Alex, for uh, co-hosting this one. It was great as always. Um, um, yeah, happy to do this uh, again some time in the in the in the near future, I guess. Let's plan on that. <laughs> yeah, definitely do that. And thanks everyone on the on the live streams, uh, Twitch, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn wherever thank you for watching and um keep uh, keep joining these sessions and 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 get certified so gotta catch them all right you gotta catch them all pokemon <laughs> <laughs> nice one nice touch stay safe everyone cheers see you bye, bye.